Our Gospel reading this morning is from Matthew chapter 10, verses 24 to 39. A disciple is not above the teacher, nor a slave above the master. It is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher and the slave like the master. If they have called the master of the house Belzebul, how much more will they belie those of his household? So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, and nothing secret that will not become known. What I say to you in the dark, tell in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who cannot destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground unperceived by your father. And even the hairs of your head are all counted. So do not be afraid. You are of more value than many sparrows. Everyone, therefore, who acknowledges me before others, I also will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I also will deny before my Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and one's foes will be members of one's own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. The most important thing in your life might be a very interesting question, probably a not good one to ask in the AFL season. How do you decide when there are so many important things, often colliding with each other. Well, I think today's gospel reading, and I thought when I first saw that gospel, well, I'm not sure I can go with this one today. It's a bit hard, some of the things that Jesus said there. Well, I then thought about it. No, I think there's something there that we need to hear and reflect on. I learnt early that being loyal to your friends was important. We had come to our school probably in about nine or ten years of age, Westbourne Park Primary School, a Hungarian lad by the name of Janus. He was one of the displaced persons that, uh, and families that uh, scattered around the world. And, you know, we Australians could be pretty hard on people who were different in those days. He spoke English pretty well, but he spoke with an accent, and he got tormented for that. But I was thought, this is not good enough. I'll make him my friend. He even came to our Sunday school, for goodness sake. But he was cared for, and we became buddies. And then Janus was accused of stealing something that's pretty precious to every kid, all boys' classes at least, in those days, your most precious thing was your pencil case. Do you remember that? And sometimes you'd scratch on it your name and whatever. They were, they were pretty precious. Um, and, but he was accused of this. And I thought, this is ridiculous. He's being picked on because he's different. I stood up for him. I, I stood up for him, supported him amongst the other friends I had and other boys in the class. And when the teacher said something that, sort of suggested he might have been the culprit. I even stood up to the teacher and said, I didn't think that's fair. Um, <laughs> then 
I was at his house. You know, you, you play with your friends after school, you go to each other's houses. In those days we used to do it. I'm sure I hope it's still the same today. Being nosy, I peeked behind a door that was closed. Do you know what I saw? Pencil cases. What was I to do? How could I now stick up for him? And at first, I didn't say anything. You know, constrained by that culture, you don't dob in your mates. It's a pretty strong thing in Australian culture, I think, in particular. But the crunch came when another boy in the class who was from Estonia had his pencil case stolen. I thought, I have to act. And I remembered something my Sunday school teacher had said. Jonathan, and I, it was the story behind this one, which I won't go into, but she, she, she said, Jonathan, sometimes there are more important things. Now, it was a question of truth and justice for other kids, more important than my friendship or loyalty to Janus, and I confronted him, not in front of the others, of course, but and he confessed. But I lost a friend. He soon left the school. I learnt three things. That some things are more important than others. There are higher loyalties. Secondly, that the culture of mateship can lead to complicity in corruption. Thirdly, that when you do take a stand for your friends, it may not make you popular. Is it possible to say there are loyalties that transcend all other things? Well, there are those people who have what I call shifting loyalties. They're kind of absorbed by one thing and then another thing Nothing's really a bit more popular than the other because something else comes about. It can be the pursuit of pleasure. Or you can have an, an, a momentary absorbing interest. I had a relative, I won't say how close this relative was, um, particularly if this is being recorded, um, might be named, uh, but whose momentary interests were just truly remarkable. You know, it was his boat. Then it was his wetsuit. He never actually got to use it because he had an outdoor shower and, and, uh, and, and tried it on and used it and then the dog got it after that and tore it to pieces. <laughs> then it was his boat. Then it was his guns. Then it was his children for a while. What next? One loyalty after another. These people have fair weather friends subject to fashion, they're hard to pin down, and in the more reflective philosophical world, they're the dilettantes, they go from one thing to another. Do they know who they really are? A bit like Woody Allen's film Zelig, where Zelig would appear in history, and he'd be a Nazi, he'd be a communist, he'd be whatever, in danger always of being manipulated. So that's the first thing, shifting loyalties. Then at the other extreme, you have people whose whole life is almost absorbed by just one thing, an all-absorbing thing that dominates everything else. Now, often, these are the good things. It's family, or it's work, or it's expressing your gifts or your passions. But who these people are is clearly defined by one thing, I once knew uh, a family where the doctor, who was the husband, was just so taken up with his work. And I happen to know that at home, the family were missing him. They clearly were below the level of what was most important to him. And I remember once, of all places in a hospital, he was walking past the corridor and we got chatting and he said, I've got to move on. I said to him, who are you when you are not a doctor? Well, he didn't like that much. 
But I did notice in the days following that he was spending a bit more time with his family. The problem of reducing all else to one important thing, and I'm not saying there aren't times in life where such thing might be necessary, but when it's so dominating, when it's so, so consuming, you become enslaved to it. That's the second thing. Many things, one thing. And then the third thing, of course, those who are unabashedly concerned with their own interests. All that's important is me and mine. The self is the centre and greed is the creed. These are the users and takers and sometimes get on and sometimes get very wealthy. And in a, perse way, in a perverse way, quite often admired, it's particularly in the tabloid press because they kind of appeal to our own selfish propensities and yet they will end up being the most despised. So, friends, ask yourselves where do you stand? Are you one with shifting loyalties? Are you one with an all-consuming focus? Do you live out of pure self-interest? Maybe we can at times be any or all or three of these at times in our lives. But just remember though, who you are is defined by who or what you regard as most important, what's worth it, what it is you bow your knee to. That's what the word worship means. You show that which is worthy. It's worth it. It's worth your life being attached to it. Which brings us to the question, what is so important is able to give us our lives in such a way that you can pin your life on it and trust that it won't let you down. Today's Gospel reading, I think, gives us some clues. And I'm not going to comment on everything in that passage of uh, the Gospel, but uh, Jesus, I think, gives us some clues to some of the things that are the most important in his scheme of things. Firstly... It's enough to be like the one you serve, to be like Jesus. That reflects who you are. There's that little bit about Beelzebub, you know. Uh, it's a bit of mystery there. We miss it because it's in Aramaic and it's a pun. That which is just life-destroying, symbolised by the figure of the devil, Beelzebub, they got it, I think, from Babylonia. Uh, is, but the real name of, Be of Beelzebub is Lord of the Flies. Okay, that's just a by the way. But then I think in Jesus' scheme of things, he also says something there. The truth will always come out. That which is whispered in the dark will be made known. And for this reason, you can withstand persecution when it happens. You may be harmed physically, but nothing can touch the real you. That's your soul, the real you, your real spirit. And then, wham, Jesus comes out with a hard saying that what we stand for, that what is so important will be a cause of conflict. I've come to bring peace. I have, sorry, I have not come to bring peace but a sword. I mean, Jesus saying that. He ratchets up what Luke says. You know, I've come to bring, I've not come to bring peace, but division here, a sword. But here we have to remember that Matthew is writing soon after the destruction of the temple and of Jerusalem in 70 AD. The Romans had had enough of these Jewish people who wouldn't bow their knee to their domination. And they went in and they, the, uh, the streets flowed with blood. It was a massacre. Not unlikely what's happening in Syria right now. And people had to flee. Some remained in Jerusalem, but mostly they moved north. The temple was destroyed. And that's when the synagogues replaced the temple. And amongst them, of course, the Christians and the Jews hadn't yet separated from each other, except it was beginning to happen. And the Christians were all caught up in this. So, 
the Jesus movement, where Jesus was the great proponent for his disciples of being the peacemakers. Don't forget that's what he said earlier. He's not advocating the sword here. Don't get that point. The point is, you take a stand for me, there will be times in history when it will be conflict all around. But I think there's more going on here. I think that this problem with the family is about the attachment to the past. There's always a generational difference. It's the younger generation that's at odds with the older generation. You think back when you were young. Can you, can you remember that? Of course we can. <laughs> uh, if you live through the 60s in particular, I know my generation, the, that was when the generations were particularly in, con in, in conflict. Generation views are often different and in conflict. And Jesus offers no easy cure. Jesus is not much into family values as we understand them today. Now, mind you, the family is important. There's enough stories with Jesus and his care for his family and his mother. But we recall what Jesus said earlier, that his true family is one that transcends family. His true family is the new community which embraces people who are beyond the family, the new community of Jesus. To love one's family more than me is to prefer the past and its origins. The new community is formed by the future. I think that's the point. The kingdom of heaven, this whole new way of relating to people that Jesus is talking about, particularly in, in Matthew and Luke, this new kingdom of heaven is where all relationships will be equal, not hierarchical as in a Jewish family at the time. Traditional power relationships will be upended, including that of the family where father and mother stand higher than son or daughter. The first will be last and the, and the, and the last will be first. It's the new age of jubilee where justice, peace, equity reign, where these are the values that are all important, but also where the threats of life will have to be confronted. And for us in our time, the great, the great threat is the future of the planet. It's where all are valued, where profound love is a true force and there's no domination. Deference to parents can be symbolic of the homage we pay to the past. Let the dead bury the dead. Jesus, I believe, is causing us, calling us to step out from the past, always into a new future. And with a new ministry about to happen here at Moriata, there will be a new future. There will be, have to be some things that will be different from the past. There will be, have to be new ways whereby we can, we can connect with the mass of people out, uh, out there who are still searching for something to give meaning to their lives, something that's so important to them that has the potential to set people free from all that constricts them and hems them in. Behind all, we're reminded there is a truth that transcends all else. And it's not the truth of ideas and of beliefs of philosophy or codes of ethics, it's about a relationship. The truth of a relationship is demonstrated, as Jesus says, by myself and my heavenly Father. To put it another way, it's the great love of God revealed in the Son. Not a passing fad or a particular role or claim, nor a lover oneself, but a liberating relationship to life, to others, to oneself, and to the source of all life. What's the, base, what's the basis of this outrageous claim? Well, it means, 
Firstly, that you and I no longer have to prove our worth. You are of more value than sparrows. Sparrows, by the way, were important. Don't get me wrong there. But this inherent value can't be proved. It can only be denied. The image of God is stamped on every human being. It means that this new relationship of worth is demonstrated in a way of life. It is the Sermon on the Mount. It is the new commandment. And the new commandment says everyone is equally important. That was what my learning was from my story about Janus. He wasn't just the important one. Our friendship wasn't just what was important. There were others to be considered. It means that all other loyalties, matters of importance, are put in their place. They're not negativised, but relativised. The nation, the family, your culture, your social groups, your friends, your mates, even the institutional church. It means that we can embrace the hard truths about life. We will have enemies if we take a Christian stand for justice and looking out for the others who are despised by others. We will be criticised. You make a stand in support of human rights and look what happened to, Julie, to Gillian Triggs. It's a, it means that we're, it's, we're also we're aware that it's not easy to be human, but we can embrace, embrace the anxiety and mortality of being human and say, we can say yes to the ambiguities of life. This yes to life is the truth about life. Not comfort or peace at any price, but the, but the truth despite the opposition it may evoke. It may mean having to live with uncertainty. Uncertainty not to be buried, but grasped and treasured. A healthy religion allows for doubts. A sick and fearful religious system seeks to remove them. And Jesus finishes with this word. You can take up your cross here and follow me. The cross here means, yes, you will make some sacrifices for the sake of that which is most important. In all of this, we discover a strange power within. It's called the economy of God. The more life is given away, the more life flows. I'm going to read a poem. It was read at Brian Robins' funeral, and I want to read it here again to you. It's a poem by D.H. Lawrence, one of my precious things, this collection of poems. We are transmitters. As we live, we are transmitters of life, and when we fail to transmit life, Life fails to flow through us. That's part of the mystery of sex. It's the flow onwards. Sexless people transmit nothing. And if, as we work, we can transmit life into our work, life, still more life, rushes into us to compensate, to be ready, and we ripple with life through the days. Even if it's a woman making an apple dumpling or a man a stool, if life goes into the pudding, good is the pudding, good is the stool. Content is the woman with fresh life rippling into her. Content is the man. Give, and it shall be given unto you, is still the truth about life. But giving life is not easy. It doesn't mean handing it out to some mean fool or letting the living dead eat you up, it means kindling the life quality where it was not. 
even if it's only in the whiteness of a washed pocket handkerchief. So friends, isn't the liberating and loving way of Jesus the most important thing? The truly liberating way of Jesus. And with it is the gift of a deep and abiding peace within the soul. Something that the world cannot give. But something which is so precious. May this be gift, may this gift be yours today and in the days to come. Amen.